Good, um, whatever time of day. <laughs> Good day. Hey, Ryan. Yeah? I just read some Toronto news. Wait. Oh, no. We're trying to do the podcast. Is it another raccoon? No, it's it? the Wayne Gretzky restaurant is closing after 26 years. Rest in peace, sis. Rip. <laughs> Wayne Gretzky can finally die. <laughs> 99, more like nine. I don't want to eat there. <laughs> 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 okay. Nine, this food is sure. mediocre. <laughs> <laughs> Why does this food taste like hockey player sweat? Why does it taste like puck? <laughs> <laughs> Why does it taste like puck? <laughs> <laughs> there the we burgers go. Burgers are made from real hockey pucks. They're ground up hockey pucks and ha- ground up beef, and it's 50 50 mix, you know? Alright. Hey, welcome to Game Punks. Hello. Uh, this is the Three Greasy Boy ASMR Part 2. The Part 1 was only heard by a select few people. Yeah. And it is still archived, yeah. and maybe one day, if you're really, really cursed, it will come back and haunt you. It is officially our lost episode. You know you're hitting... The only one so far, might I add. Yes. You know you're hitting big when, uh... You have a shitty episode, episode that you can't post. <laughs> Well, maybe your big fucking legs are in the way, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> we have a we have a guest today. Hi. For the second time, for except the, second for the first time. time. Whomst are you, guest? Hi. Um, my name is Dex. Mac. Yeah. Oh, true, Mac. <laughs> Forgot my, about that. My name is Mac. My name is Mac. And me. <laughs> uh, and the Mac. I'm in Montreal for the next seven days, and Ryan's like, hey podcast and i was like oh okay have you guys seen the new spider-man yet? yes we have yes, we damn it damn oh, shit. Shit. we should do that but okay did you did you i see how it be no do, I, do you want to see it <laughs> uh yeah i do actually the spider-man movies are the only mcu movies that i care about uh yeah i mean that would that would be fun i we could we could plan that later i i don't know yeah. what days we'd necessarily be free this week but i wouldn't mind going to catch a showing that would be fun that'd be fun yeah it would be it would be perfectly good sicaroni uh but yeah uh welcome to game punks we have a guest it is my partner his name is dex uh this is our podcast and uh we have uh things to talk about question mark (laughs) yeah we didn't keep up the news uh this week because I mean, you were in Toronto. Yeah, and, and honestly, I was lazy. Essentially, there's been like um, no news. <laughs> well, there's the one thing, but we should probably save that for last because it sucks. Yeah. It, well, yes. Exactly. It, there's no news that's good to talk about. Yeah. I mean, there's some video game stuff, but uh, nothing too crazy. Like nothing noteworthy mm-hmm. uh, that I kept track of. I mean, there's probably some stuff that would be interesting to both of us, um, but this is probably going to be a short episode with a um, a sad end, I guess. Kind of. We've got to talk about that. It's not. Yeah, it's not. It isn't fun. But uh, until we get to that, because that's upsetting news, uh, I guess we could talk about what we did in Toronto. Which was uh, a lot, actually. We did a lot. We did do a lot. Um, so every time that I go to Toronto, I try to kind of get a weekly itinerary so that yeah. we know what we're doing. Weekly itinerary. A checklist. Yeah, well, we, we, we always plan kind of ahead of time what yeah. it is, the things we want to do. Yeah, that way you don't get lost in the sea of condos. Exactly. True. So one of the first things we did is we decided we we're going to go with our friend Jared to see uh spider-man which we did and it was good uh i i won't say too much to spoil it but i will say that in terms of mcu movies it might be one of my favorites it's definitely in terms of live action spider-man movies my absolute favorite yeah. Without a, okay. Without a doubt in my mind, it is the best live action Spider Man movie ever made. Good, good, good. Even better than Spider Man Three. Yeah. Nothing can beat Spider Man Three, Ryan. So nothing. Nothing. You're a it's goddamn in, liar. Even better than the Amazing Spider Man Two. I 
you thought that? Yikes. I think about yeah. that movie all the time for some reason, movies. and it, like, haunts me. The movie is awful. Like, I, I have flashbacks to uh, the the Bucktooth scene where his teeth, like, fuse back together because of the electricity or some oh, shit. Oh, it's so me stupid. Too. Do you remember that? Yes. He feel, like, he falls into the bat of eels and his... Uh, tooth malformity gets repaired just, somehow just and you're like, thinking about that i wish it gives was me that a easy. fucking headache honestly the, you know uh, what? let's talk spider-man movies for a second because yeah. it's been on my mind lately so spider-man one good sam raimi did all right i it wasn't the best i used to have fine. some pretty dismal opinions on the spider-man trilogy by sam raimi to be honest like i used to think i want to say even as recently as like last year my opinion of them had sunken quite low. Oh yeah, no, it's and I going would, back to watch those are hard. I was I was kind of I'm just, there's a part of me that's disappointed in them. Maybe because I've been so spoiled by like the interconnectivity of the MCU, but also like by just being somebody who reads a lot of comics. I always kind of find it inherently disappointing when characters you know, that exist in the same universe as other characters in most forms of media just to have a story that doesn't even reference that other stuff or involve it too deeply. But then I got to thinking, okay, the Raimi movies, they kind of actually do do one thing pretty good, and that's act as an adaptation of the original Spider-Man comics by Steve Ditko and Stan Lee. Like, in terms of yeah. their tone, in terms of the kind of storytelling that they're attempting to replicate, they're yeah. pretty close to some of that first, you know, the first 32 issues of Spider-Man yeah, by, by uh, Lee and Ditko. It really, like, different kind of stuff for the time. And these <laughs> movies are, are interesting in that they're also kind of introducing a new kind of superhero movie to uh, audiences and... You know, they, they have a lot in common as well with the the two really good superhero movies that had pretty much come out previously, which were... Blade? Uh, no, they're not similar to Blade. Uh, Superman's one... Super, yeah, Superman 1 and... Oh, yeah, because uh, Superman had movies. I forget about those old-ass Superman movies. Superman, Superman 1 and Batman Returns. I think the first Tim Burton's Batman is okay. I think Batman Returns is really excellent. I think that's a, mm-hmm. that's a, a fantastic... I, I don't know movie. how much of it is nostalgia for me, because, like, you know, it was yeah. like, probably one of the first superhero movies I ever saw, and it was Batman and yeah. fucking... It's, just, I mean, it's whatever. Batman, come on. <laughs> yeah. But I think... Even if it is just nostalgia goggles, I think it's one of those things that, like, you can't defeat. Mm -hmm. Like, nothing you say about that movie will ever make me be like, it's a bad movie. No, exactly. Like, I I just have such a a fondness for it because of my memories of it being so vivid in my mind all the time whenever I think about what a superhero movie is and what 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 it means to be a movie in that genre. So... Like, the first three Spider-Man movies kind of occupy a similar place for me. But the reason my opinion had grown so dismal, as previously stated, is because, like, Marvel has since, like, spoiled me with storytelling and world building. Just to an extent that those movies could never possibly have even thought was possible. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, looking back on them now, I've kind of developed a keen interest in them. Especially because of, like I said, recently rereading a lot of those early Lee and Ditko Spider-Man comics and getting a feel for what those comics are like, what kind of storytelling they're kind of operating on at that time too. And, you know, 1960s, uh, the landscape is pretty different in terms of what comic book storytelling is. And those first couple of issues, I swear, are like, it's like one very very well-known spider-man villain after another uh like each each issue is almost debuting like a villain who is later going to be an iconic part of spidey's rogues gallery yeah like and at least a b-tier villain ex- no yeah exactly if b-tier if not sinister six straight up yeah, yeah which yeah. is great like dr octopus is issue four if i recall correctly mm-hmm. like it's it's crazy to me to think that oh hit after hit after hit in terms of uh like villain introduction and the only character i can think of who has as good a rogues gallery as spider-man is batman and he's from the other company you know yeah like i think spider-man has such an iconic rogues gallery and 
thinking about how those characters are portrayed in those early comics and the lengths that the Raimi movies go to like properly establish these characters alongside Peter as really like I guess fully engaged narratively uh narratively relevant characters is something that the later MCU movies only just started getting good at. Mm-hmm. You know, like it's these these yeah yeah this whole idea of Marvel movies don't have good antagonists a lot of the time comes from you know a lot of the the first few movies in the MCU. But it is true that the first couple of movies in the MCU, you know, apart from maybe like Red Skull and Loki, I can't think of anybody who stands out as particularly memorable in terms of their you know presence as an antagonistic force within the movie whereas in the first the first three raimi movies you get uh the green goblin in the first one played by defoe and he's great in the role he does i think probably one of my favorite green goblins he's amazing he's yeah he's up there in terms of like the best ever portrayals of that character alongside steve bloom and spectacular spider-man doing a yeah a really amazing um green goblin there as well and then you have dr octopus in the next movie who's played uh like amazingly well uh by mm-hmm. uh, alfred Molina. and honestly uh that second movie would like for me it would have been fine if the escalation to world ending bullshit didn't happen you know yeah i suppose but also i i like i feel like i blown up it, 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 it is stayed. a little overboard at that ending sequence yeah. but i do like how they round out doc ock's character arc because the the whole movie he's struggling at you know with this idea of him being like now I'm a freak I'm an outsider nobody's going to accept the way that my brain works what I'm thinking I'm doing and he, he you know he's yeah he thinks he's acting altruistically in a sense that you know obviously most great written villains don't think of themselves as the antagonists mm-hmm. but he I think particularly stands out to me as like a really memorable and well performed well written antagonist uh, in superhero movie canon and then the next movie you get you get two you actually get three villains um two of them I think are are rather well executed one of them could have been executed better but I think Spider-Man 3 is the kind of thing that's going to make me an apologist to it eventually because as much as like that venom performance isn't the best and as much as it's Ugh. it's like literally just historically in there because sony was demanding that they insert i um genuinely forgot a who played venom in that movie it's but topher grace it's, yeah i know it's topher grace eric but Foreman. i forgot that venom was even in that fucking movie yeah like, every time anyone ever mentions Venom, I'm always like, oh yeah, he was there. And I- because 3 was so... The only thing I remember th- from 3 is uh, the dance sequence. Oh god. And yeah. Peter Parker starting to be a dick. And Mary Jane being like, I'm breaking up with you again. Again for the I fifth am the, time. I, I am the plot point of this movie, apparently. And it's like, fuck, get, come on. I feel like it's... Uh, maybe... Maybe to the the series' detriment that they never really tried to do the whole Peter Parker's first love was, um, you know, Gwen Stacy, and Gwen Stacy fucking bit the bullet real hard because of him. Like, I I feel like that, yeah. that first Spider-Man movie with Green Goblin and Green Goblin maybe, you know, killing Gwen mm-hmm. would have made the emotional arc of Peter and Mary Jane's relationship work a lot more strongly because you recognize at that point onwards, like they could have, yeah. they could have introduced MJ into the movie uh, in the first one and also had Gwen Stacy there and had them be friends or whatever, you know, that would have been great. That's what they did in um, some of my favorite adaptations of Spider-Man. Mm-hmm. But, um, and Gwen is like a really important character and she is in Spider-Man three, but she's like a total non-character. Yeah. She's like, She's there. She exists. Yeah, she exists like, to be eh? kind of like Spider-Man's eh? rebound, which kind of sucks. Mm-hmm. Which, like, like when Peter gets all fucking mean and shit, he uh, like rebounds from uh, MJ to Gwen, which is shitty and awful. But yeah. um, like Thomas Hayden Church gives like a fucking amazing performance as Sandman in that movie, like a really, yeah. really yeah. good performance as Sandman. The, that that's the thing about that movie especially is like 
Sandman stood out more than Venom. Yeah, and... Like, how do you fuck that up? I mean, Sandman is a great character in his own right, and one of, like, Mm -hmm. Spidey's most iconic villains. I mean, he's a member of the Sinister Six. Like, that's straight-up icon status for me. It's not to downplay Sandman so much as it is to be like, I forget that Venom is in the movie. Oh, yeah. Whereas Sandman is like... I, for me, Sandman's the only villain in that movie. I also forget that the Green Goblin Part Two. No, no, no. Yeah, the Green different Goblin movie, Part Two. Different movie. They call him. Just, Wait, is it? They just call him the Green oh, Goblin yeah. again. But what I like about what I like about that part is like I think that Green Goblin arc is actually really well executed mm-hmm. because it feels earned because there's been two entire ass movies where Harry is a fully established character. The first movie he shit on. Yeah, the first movie he established he you, you establish that he sees Spider-Man put Norman's dead body back in the house. So now he hates Spider-Man and the second movie it's all him kind of actively actively fucking getting upset about Spider-Man being everywhere and Spider-Man ruining his life and him growing apart from Peter. And then at the end of that movie when he finds out that Peter is Spider-Man, he's like fuck you and then the first Mm -hmm. like major action set piece of the next movie immediately following is his fight with harry uh as the green goblin and i think that's a great story arc that gets kind of tied up really nicely because at the very end of the movie harry sacrifices himself and fights alongside peter recognizing and forgiving him and trying to make amends for his father's actions and that shit is good like that's good fucking cinema cinematic storytelling, and I'm thinking back on it. And I'm like, damn, that it was especially for the time very ambitious, and I think that they executed it as well as they possibly could. The Venom stuff, it feels shoot in because it is. Yeah, Sony was like, you do it. Yeah, no, it's like, spe- okay. I think specifically Avi Arad was like, if you don't put Venom in this movie, I'm going to fucking <laughs> kill you, and. Pretty much. To which Sam Raimi said, what? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and then he did. Uh, and then Avi Arad is basically the reason that The Amazing Spider-Man and Amazing Spider-Man 2 happened. And both of those movies are... I mean, the first Amazing Spider-Man is like... I, It's, it's like the most mediocre possible film yeah. you, you could make about Spider-Man. I remember, like, I remember thinking that uh, Tobey Maguire was a really good Peter Parker. Kind of a shitty Spider-Man. Andrew Garfield was a shitty Peter Parker. And kind of a, a pretty good pretty good Spider Man, yeah. Yeah. Meanwhile, Tom Holland kind of Tom Holland big, fucking nails Big both. dicks his manlet self into here, and he's the yeah. best of both worlds. He's he's a tr- Spider Man's superpower is reminding you that he is a child. Yeah, he's he is a truly great <laughs> Peter Parker and a truly great Spider Man. And he does this all while playing a version of Peter Parker that is really really different from the peter parker in the comics like so much so that i don't think people actually realize how different they are in terms of their mo and their attitudes Mm -hmm. the way they act like they're they're almost indistinguishable he's all he's indistinguishable from the peter parker in the comics but at the same time he is peter parker we recognize that he's peter despite the character being so superficially and even kind of psychologically different than peter in the uh the comics but it's it's great yeah. that he he manages to communicate that this but is I mean, peter it's parker good cause it's, it, it comes off as its own thing also exactly exactly and so. that's that's something that i think andrew garfield spider-man tried kind of too hard to make peter as cool as spider-man yeah and like spider-man his, andrew garfield spider-man was very uh witty and comic-y mm-hmm. uh almost to the point of like being like is this a Deadpool sometimes. Yeah. We're like, it wasn't fourth wall breaking, but some of the like, there, there's some, comments, there's some kind like, of wink is... at the audience moments yeah, that yeah, are a yeah, little yeah. tiresome. Yeah. It, and you're like, ah, okay. Yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> there's, there's something to be said about the Deadpoolification of Spider-Man in recent years, actually. Yeah. Because, um, I mean, you're familiar with the ultimate Spider-Man cartoon, right? Yeah, and Deadpool uh, got some play in there. Yeah, so Deadpool is in that show. And mm. the thing is, before they do the episode with Deadpool, who's, who's played by Will Friedel, so he's played by frickin' uh, Terry McGinnis, which is kind of cool. Yeah. Um, they kind of have this... Also did the voice for the game, right? No, that was Nolan North. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Although he's a, he's a pretty alright Deadpool. 
Uh, yeah. Honestly, though, I think at this point, Ryan Reynolds fucking owns that role. Yeah, no, he's he owns that. Voice. He's gonna just, die in that role. He, oh yeah, no, he yeah. will. He's gonna be like eighty-seven. Like they're gonna wheel him into a. And yeah, they're gonna do an old. <laughs> they're gonna do an old man Deadpool movie as a joke. Yeah, he'll make a fu- like a bad bad grandpa except with Deadpool. Yeah, they'll fucking they do it. They would do it. He'll have a cameo in the uh, the the Gwenpool movie that will inevitably come to fruition. I really would love for that to happen. Holy fuck, that'd be so cool. Me too. That comic was great. The comic is dope and it has beautiful I'm artwork. So glad they're doing that. Oh, it's so good. But um but um uh yeah as I was saying, yeah the dead <laughs> the deadpoolification of Spider-Man. There's there's been so much Spider-Man media lately and a lot of it has kind of shifted Spider-Man's humor from being why a, like a wise cracker to straight up being fucking Deadpool. Yeah. And I don't know how I feel about that cuz on one hand I it's not like I think Deadpool's meta humor is terribly boring or tiresome like it's often pretty funny and it it works yeah. at least for me i know for a number of people it, it is quite annoying and i, I sympathize because there's tons of stuff that other people find fucking hilarious that i cannot stand when people are just yeah. like oh poo poo caca yeah that's funny to me yeah also but you know <laughs> like there there is you know there's a part of me that's kind of like eye rolly at the cynicism towards the kind of humor deadpool is doing because it's like just it's funny like enjoy yeah, just, enjoy a good laugh it's there for a cheap laugh and it knows it's they're making the laugh. comic book know it's a comic book let it just let it rock yeah like i like that's why I, I don't understand the- i don't understand this this cynicism towards that idea because it's like like i get it the, uh, the it seems kind of rote like do you understand he thinks he's a he knows he's <laughs> yeah. in a comic book wink wink and i'm like okay i get how that humor yeah. can be fucking tiresome i sympathize but it's also fucking i sympathize hilarious. but it's funny like if it's poorly executed like, it's not funny the but it's only not. reason deadpool 2 was good was because it knew it was a shitty movie yeah no it it, acknow- like, it acknowledges that as like a piece of cinema it's infinitely worse and more fanficy and pandery so it leans into those like bad cinema conventions and has fun with its formula all the while actually kind of attempting to do something rather kind of cool with the fun. character and it's you know, fun and different I, I think and like, they they made a really different movie from the first one yeah, yeah they're making a deadpool 3 yeah i know they are confirm. yeah that, that would be good i'd, I'd watch it because i you know i like I'm the excited. deadpool movies i'm more excited for deadpool 3 than i was for stranger things 3 more on that later oh, Jesus Christ. okay we haven't watched <laughs> it yet but you're allowed to spoil it i know the spoilers uh, please spoil it Okay, yeah, I'll just I'll go in depth and I I'm gonna pop off about that. But yeah, I don't know. I feel like Spider Man's become a lot more Deadpool y lately and I don't know if I'm I'm totally a hundred percent behind that direction because I like the wise cracky Spider Man best and I think what I like the most or one of the elements I like the most about the humor in Far From Home is that there is some wise cracky spidey humor but they've kind of opted to make this version of Spider Man less wise cracky in the heat of battle. And I kind of get it, because this is yeah, a Peter Parker sense. that has seen some shit. This is a Peter Parker that has been to fucking space, as they point out in the movie. And Nick Fury literally says, bitch, please, you have been to space to him. Yeah. Like, you, please stop pretending that this shit is ridiculous to you anymore, Peter. You have been to space and fought aliens. I mean, it's also a child that died and then came and back. And came back, like, five years later. Yeah, like I was oh. just about to say he died. So this is a Peter who's, like had some cosmic level trauma and then like his i understand if he's not so willing to crack a joke anymore and then his like mentor figure just straight up like disintegrates Fuck, yeah fucking bit the dust real hard and this is a peter parker that it is implied has now lost two significant father figures in his life <laughs> and more on that and how it relates to Mysterio once, and the version of Mysterio they execute in the movie once you watch it. But yeah, uh, let's just say I heard some cool things. Who happen. boy? Yeah. Who boy? They really play into the whole wow. This this Peter's got a lot of trauma, boyo. <laughs> that well, I mean, that's like I said. My favorite thing about this Spider Man is his his superpower is reminding you he is a child. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> and like, oof, and and lit and going through some fucking rough shit. Yeah, the shit that a, ch- a child should never have to go through. Okay, so that's enough Spidey talk because we've talked about Spider Man for like fucking twenty minutes. I want to yeah. know about Stranger Things three because uh, Dex and I have been calling it the uh, Brainworm Show. 
because every time we think about it, it gives us fucking brain worms. Oh man! So please, uh... all right. So I'm go sickle mode on this. Shit. Have Have we ever spoken about the previous two seasons? Like what our no, thoughts were? No, we haven't. Because uh, I think I th- no, 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 no. We haven't. Because we started the podcast way after season two ever happened. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah, what did you think uh, of the first two seasons? Season one, uh, I got into it late. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was ruined by the amount of people being like, it's the best thing ever, oh my god! And I was like, I don't get it, and all the, like, ego memes and shit. Yeah, oh my, yeah. Uh, I was like, okay, what? And then I watched it, and I was like, it was okay, I guess. Overhyped, whatever. It's it's basically just a pretty great, you it's know, like mini-series. Yeah, it's good, it's good. It, there's nothing about season one that I was like, this sucks. I was just kind of like, it's... It does it's, it. It's a you know. It's, it's a perfect. It's a perfectly like good Fine. watch. It's perfect. Yeah, like yeah. nothing about it will make you go uh, but nothing about it made me go uh either. Mm-hmm. You know exactly. Like I wasn't ridiculously hyped. Season two, I was like, oh, here we go again. Okay, <laughs> here we yeah. go again. Oh. What this time? Oh shit! Here we go again. I, and that was fine. I thought Billy was a pretty cool addition of like just a human being an asshole. Don't look at me, Ryan. Don't look at me. <laughs> Do not look at me. Billy mean posting. Yeah, I've I've been I, made fun on the internet. Dex right? Dex likes the 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 racist hair metal man. Shut up. Yeah, of course. Wow. <laughs> I mean, you've been in that Discord server for more than twenty minutes, so. Yeah. Exactly. But, yeah, I, I know what's going on. He but he it's likes fine. that man. Like Billy was Billy was okay as like a, a evil man. He, he's a perfectly. Like, he was very hateable. He's a great yeah. He's a great antagonist. Yeah, very hateable. And he's a great and like, human right. antagonist that isn't like a scientist. Like he's a yeah. he's an antagonist or a that monster. he's an antagonist that has kind of relatable motivations. Uh, yeah, and well, I mean. He's sure. I mean, in the sense that you you <laughs> get why he's a dick, as opposed to like yes. the faceless government scientists being evil because evil government shade, shadow organization yeah. is evil. You know, Illuminati. Like what? Literally, um, what? What possible advantage does ta- does tapping? Yeah, I know they keep saying Russia, but really, rush, what? Rush, rush. What uh, possible it's advantage? The space does, race, but to hell. It's so stupid. <laughs> speed race it's, me it, to hell. It's absolutely <laughs> yeah. It's the hell speed. That running. I think the whole idea of the upside down being something the U.S. government thinks it could weaponize is just about one of the stupidest, most unbelievable parts of the whole show. Which I get it. I'm saying something is unbelievable in a show about psychic children and giant like monsters. Yeah, from no, other but it's just it feels really weird. It my suspension of disbelief halts when I hear. Okay, but there's a shadow lab in fucking uh, the middle of Indiana doing experiments to tap into a secret second dimension inhabited by Lovecraftian hell monsters. Yeah, and so we can get somehow, the to go fuck up the Russians. Yeah, somehow they're good, they think they can control this. Like, I get the United States is, is like that. Yeah. But in a show that includes, like, as much as it does already, to have those, like cold war size like stakes yeah. E. yeah it's just a little funny remember, remember, remember. but that's it like season two ends and you're like okay there's some stuff i really hear... like in that season i like yeah, i like I, mean, it's not a bad I like season. the big Billy. monster the big one the big yeah the big monster's cool yeah what's it called again what are they called? it's one of the D D characters Shadow. What? Mind Flayer? Yeah, no, the Mind Flayer. Yeah. I like the yeah. Mind Flayer. I think that thing is um, fucking actually terrifying. I thought it was cool that Hopper got sent to Underworld or Upside Down, whatever yeah. the fuck they call it. I thought that was nice that it wasn't just Will dying for a whole season. And as always, the I think like, the production <laughs> values on the show are really high. It's good. Like, Amazing. It, it looks, soundtrack. It looks, soundtrack is one of my favorite things about the show. It looks like, and sounds incredible, and the practical like sets, special effects, uh, wardrobe choices, they're like to the, the finest level of detail period accurate, and I find that really, really yeah. commendable. I think the only thing in season one that made me go, ah, was when uh, fucking uh, Finn Wolfhard's character is playing a Street Fighter cabinet. It's not even Street Fighter 2, it's Street Fighter 1, which is the worst. Oh, that terrible game. Yeah, and you're just like, ah. Fighting Street. I know that. 
It sucks. But yeah, I know. Yeah, but it sucks, but it's still Street Fighter, and you're like, they did it right. Sometimes, so, sometimes Ryan and I will be talking about, like, Stranger Things, and it'll just be like, this show sometimes just kind of becomes so, like, straight and, like, so heterosexual that in a way it oh, wraps it's back around to being gay somehow. Yeah. yeah. And it's just sort of like, remember, like, my whole, like, conspiracy theory about here's why Billy is queer-coded in 800 words? And you were like, shut the fuck <laughs> Please up. Please shut the fuck up. You were like, I'm shut I'm not up. reading this essay. Yeah, no one, yeah. no one wants to read my essay. Shut up, this is a Wendy's. Take, we're taking your order, you're getting your <laughs> that's me at Wendy's. And you're getting the Wendy's. fuck out. That's me at my, that's me at Wendy's. <laughs> But I, I got. Um, I think that uh, that would be another criticism we have of the show. It's it's really fucking straight. I yeah, know se- they, season three. They try. Season three, they, they tr- finally introduce a queer character. But honestly, my motherfucker. Maybe too. Too little, too late. Yeah, I, I get it. Will is gay. Whatever. Yeah. Yeah, I, I know the boy's gay. He's gay. We've That's known. A gay we've, boy. No, we've known this. That is a gay boy. Was, We've been new. He was in fun. the upside down for how long? And he's not going to be not gay. Yeah, come on. I mean, Shut I mean, up. the motherfucker is the mage when you play D anD D. The mage the friend up- is always <laughs> the queer friend. That's just the upside down. How it fucking works. Is the upside down a metaphor also, for the closet? Yes. Also, in season three, he has like a little Confirmed. outfit. He has like a little wizard mage outfit, and I'm like, that's that's very gay. That's extremely. It's gay. also purple and has stars on it. Oh, that's gay. Yeah, and I'm like, okay, so. So, why is it then that they're trying to call this other character their queer character? LMAO. Anyway. She's a Lebanese. Yay? I mean, that's... that's <laughs> look, one person of color in this whole show that isn't... Um... No, she's le- lesbian. Oh, a les... Oh, whoops. Le- yeah. You're dumb. <laughs> Ryan has to go lie down now. <laughs> yeah, you the podcast go. is over. The podcast is cancelled. With the Lebanese... <laughs> Uh, so she's a so they have they have one counted on one finger one beslian yeah well done so season three linda lockhart season three what is what is the the scoop on season three okay so see how far are you into season three? we have not watched a single episode and i do not care if i'm spoiled please all right fair enough um so season three is uh it's been a while since the spooky things happened and everyone got used to normal life again but then the spooky things kind of come back up, right? Okay. Like, my fridge magnets don't stick to my fridge anymore. Me too. So that's fucking weird, right, I don't Hopper? Like that. I don't Isn't like it weird, that. Hopper, that my fridge magnets don't stop to the <laughs> thing anymore? And Hopper's like, shut up, you're being crazy. In which point, you as a viewer are like, Hopper, are you fucking kidding me? Also, you're not even going to entertain there. the was... fucking idea. Yeah, like, you're not going to entertain the idea that maybe something is a mist. That, yeah, is this costume not gay? I'm showing okay, Ryan a that's picture. Gay. I can't find the actual picture, but the, for the Funko Pop, oh yeah, the yeah, it has the costume. So I'm showing Ryan the costume. Like it has silver little stars on it, and it's purple. Yeah. That's a gay boy, and there's a hat with it. The boy is a homosexual. Yeah. Anyway, continue about that's that's actually the only thing they give you in the whole show. <laughs> this boy um, is a homosexual. I can tell. <laughs> the man is gay. Oh, congratulations, gay child. man. This man's is gay. Um. But yeah, uh, fucking, so Hopper's like, I don't know about this, and then, uh, fuck, they're, they're like, not together the whole season either, like, there's three different storylines happening all at the same time, and they're all connected, but, like, the gang's all split up. Okay. Um, uh, there's some shit about, like, a Russian, so there, a new mall opens in their town, and inevitably it's owned by a Russian secret government who's trying to reenact the uh, opening of the portal to do what the Americans did. Why would the Russians be there? I don't know. But they are. But they are, because it's yeah, the 80s. There. Cause, yeah, it's the 80s. So, and the know. Red Scare is real, as we all know. Yeah, fucking commies. Yeah, I know, right? um, So one of the storylines is uh, a couple of the characters going into the Russian secret base... Uh, another storyline is like the adults kidnapping one of the Russians from the secret base and not speaking Russian and having a translator and that's it's he's cute he's like the the Russian man is the highlight of this season for me okay he's just he's he's happy and likes American things and it's it's just it's wholesome okay. it's very wholesome he's like disappointed to be activated essentially yeah well like because he's 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 Doing the experiments kind of against his will. Uh, they killed okay, his okay. superior in front of him, and they were like, do it. And he was like, well, 
you know, I enjoy the life, so... He's like, I like America. It is a nice place. I would like to live. Please, thank you. Um, uh, they do this thing where they show a new monster. I don't remember what they call it. But it's much smaller than in Season 2. And it's much slimier and very CG and on the screen way too much. Uh, um, mm-hmm. To the point where you're like, okay, okay yeah, whatever. I get it. It um, exists. Essentially... Like, the whole thing's very, like, watchable. It it follows the trend of the first two seasons where you're like, ah, yeah, guess, it's enjoyable. I guess that Nothing... happened. Yeah, it's just like, <laughs> but then, okay. But then the worst thing possibly happens, Ryan. Yes, I know the yeah, worst thing possibly happens. Then the worst happens. thing possibly yeah, happens. Yeah, wait, it ends, right? And, like, Hopper dies because they, they kill the thing and they close the generator. The other bad thing happens. We all know why Hopper really dies because David Harbour is fucking done with this shit and he wants to go yeah, make real tired. entertainment. Which is fair. Like Hellboy. But, I was but then, like, right? They move out. They move out of the house. They move out of the country because they're like, maybe we should move away from this fucking town. And I'm like, why didn't you do that in season one? One time was enough. Anyway. Yeah. Um, that, it's, and then it's happening you, you, again. It, it looks like the credits are rolling, right? And you're like, oh, wow. Thank God. Season three's over. They're finished. It's good. They're all moved. Oh, what? Meanwhile in Russia? Oh, no. What do you mean, meanwhile in Russia? And then two guards come up to a prison cell and they're like, get the American. And then they shove him in the cage with a, another Demi Gorgon. Uh, no, one of the little dog things from season two. The, uh, oh, the Demi Dogs, yeah. Yeah, the Demi Dogs. And then it ends and you're like, wow, season four. I, I, was, <laughs> okay. at my, I was at my own birthday party. So this season came out on the day of my birthday. And it's my party i'll cry if yeah I want to. and i was at my i was at my <laughs> own birthday party and i'm sitting on the couch and i was thinking about how billy died and then i did like disassociated for like 20 minutes on my own birthday party <laughs> i just kind <laughs> oh, of yeah. like billy billy gets it hard billy just did and i was like mm, thanks <laughs> thank you and then, t- and then like a week later they canceled the power ranger sequel <laughs> <laughs> so like dacre montgomery has nothing lined up for 2020 <laughs> I feel bad for Not that yet. guy. Cause Maybe it'll be... I wanted Power Maybe. Rangers 2017 to get a sequel. It was good. Yeah, but like everyone's kind of like doing other things now. Yeah, I know. They're, all of those actors are like actually making big movies now. Except for Dick Montgomery. Except for Dick Montgomery. God bless his poor soul. He's just going to porn. He's... Yeah, he could. Honestly, he could. But like retro. Like he could just do that. He's a pretty good twink, I have to say. Yeah. She's got that. He's anyway, got that yeah. rock and twink bod. My gripes with season three is essentially why, 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 are we why doing the this? meanwhile in Russia? You could have, like, honestly, season three could have ended with them moving, and like, just that could have been the end of Stranger Things, and I would have been like, Stop it. it went on a little long, but this is fine. <laughs> season four is well, gonna fucking ruin it's because it. They I don't to, like. What are you gonna do? They have to like pitch for season four because apparently they want to make five seasons of this thing no no i don't know i read <laughs> somewhere that they want to make four or five seasons so they, they have need to, to let it because end. there was a rumor going around that netflix was going to cancel stranger things because they're kind of like yeah we're, we're done with this uh so the duffer brothers have to give a reason to pitch a, another season so i think that's there is why... no reason well the things that the duffer brothers don't know when to stop <laughs> Well, they, yeah, all but... they do is make a season, introduce way too many new characters that don't really go anywhere. Kill off half of them. And kill off the half end. of them by the end of it, and then move on to the next season. Like You gotta kill the old characters to make room for the new characters. Yeah, like, I... it's just what like, are the kids weird... like What do the kids like? They like the gays? Kill four straights, give them one gay. You know what I'm, I'm actually kind of really deeply disappointed about? That this series could have easily worked as an anthology. Yeah. Yeah. And anthology television is back right now in a super big way. Had you done like an '80s flavored anthology sci-fi horror series with this like name behind it, or maybe like different people across different places encountering the upside down, like building yeah. your own internal well, lore and having that's different essentially characters? What I wanted for season two, yeah, originally. same here. It was like I don't want these same kids. I don't even care. I don't. I don't care. Like, they're perfect. This is, they're perfectly this is the rebuild great series, protagonists for the except, first season. Because you know how in the rebuild for e- Evangelion, when you're in the room with Shinji and all the other uh, new EVA pilots, and you're like, I want to stay in this room, but then the camera follows Shinji out. Yeah. And you're like, oh. 
I mean, okay, okay. It, that is just... It sort of does, like, a weird... Mm. It's, like, kind of like Degrassi, like, in the worst way. Where it's, like, they'll keep a small section of characters and you have to stick with them throughout whatever. And then there's, like, these other characters that just kind of, like, come in and then leave. And then you're just yeah. like, cool, that went nowhere. Why did we have to deal with this for three episodes? It's kind of it's kind of annoying. It's like Degrassi. Because we're making so much money. Yeah, because we're making fucking trillions of dollars off merchandising. Uh, so yeah, Stranger Things season three. What is what's your verdict in the end? Uh, like watch it because I mean you might as well. Uh, <laughs> glowing, a <laughs> glowing endorsement. Fuck, if you want ten out of ten. If you want brain worms, <laughs> watch Stranger Things season three. Yeah. If you want, like I don't know. If you want to laugh at, I didn't ha- have a bad time. I didn't, if, I didn't have a bad time until the very end when the credits start to come up, and then it's like, meanwhile, in Russia, and you were like, three months fuck later, and you're this. Like, no! Listen, if you want to watch a show in which a twink with a mullet who is a racist gets murdered, there you go. Yeah. There we go. Before almost fucking Will's mom. No, it's Mike's mom. Woman. Mike's mom. Oh, why do I know this? Mom. They're all the same. No, they're not. Joyce is yeah. valid. Fuck off. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. When in a, yeah, yeah when she's a valid, valid woman. She's pretty good. <laughs> fucking freak. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, so a glowing endorsement from Ben. Yeah. Uh, I mean, nobody cares about my it, opinion. It's. <laughs> what do you think about Stranger Things? Eh. Eh. Pretty much every reaction I've had for every season that came yeah. out. Yeah. But Ryan. Except this one is actually more of a, like, Stranger Things 1 and 2 is like, eh. This one's like, eh. Mm. But Ryan, do you, you care know, about my opinion like, about season 3? I mean, I don't care about really season 3 at all. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, Quite honestly, that's fair. I I I still haven't watched it, and I don't even know if I'm going to. I'm already hurt. I'm it's... really. I was at my birthday party, and I wanted to kill myself. I mean, I I'll be honest. I've I've watched so much like better TV over the last couple of months that I'm just like not even remotely interested in getting into Stranger. Have Things you watched properly. Fire Force? Cause yes, I, I. That is a heavy endorsement. I will give that. Show. On my way to Toronto, I watched the first two episodes of Fire Force, and I have to say, what if what if firefighters but JRPG companions? Okay, so do you know what Fire Force is? No. Me? Okay, so. There's this new anime that started. It's based on a shonen manga that's been running in Shonen Jump for like the better part of a year now, I think. Yeah. It's called Fire Force, and it's set in an alternate it's Tokyo epic. And th- this Tokyo kind of looks like Edo era Tokyo with like wood and kind of like wood skyscrapers and stuff like that. It looks really cool. Yeah. And there's some there's like a European touch to it. Yeah, too, it, it looks they have this big cathedral like yeah. uh base. It's just an old church, yeah, an old shitty church. rundown church. It it looks like a mix between Edo era Tokyo, San Francisco, and like London. Yeah. It's a really it's a, it looks vibes. like kind of industrial era London mixed with a bunch of other kind of aesthetics. But it's very it's a very pretty looking show. What if colonialism but less aggressive? But the series follows a group of firefighters called the Fire Force, who are essentially advanced firefighters who are trained to dispatch of these creatures called Infernals. Uh, they're they're called pyrotechnics, if I'm not mistaken. No, and they're, and they're, like, they're they're Infernals, aren't they called Infernals? No, 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 no. I mean the the humans. Oh, the humans. Yeah, pyro On pyro the fire force. pyrokinetics. Yeah. Yes, pyrokinetics. pyrokinetics yeah. And uh, they there's. Three generations now? Mm. Well, probably more, but, like, the, the fourth generation is children, so they can't really do yeah. anything. Uh, but each generation has more advanced uh, fire powers, like, fire-wielding mm-hmm. powers. Like, second gen can uh, just kind of put out flames or start flames if they have a uh, accelerant mm-hmm. with them, like gas or whatever. Uh, but third generation uh, can just... Straight up generate fire. Summon flames out of nowhere. Yeah. And uh, you learn of the main character's uh, troubled past, mm-hmm. where in which he f- murders his mother and brother. Yeah, too. because his powers go out like, of control. Yeah, Me too. he yeah. had a nightmare or something. His shit. name is his name is Shinra, and he's yeah, pretty Shinra. he's pretty likable. He's as far as shonen protagonists go. I mean the whole the whole squad so far this is not a single person that I'm. Like, I like them. Eh. I, I think I like Obi. Yeah, Obi's best. Obi is awesome. Obi's best boy. I, I think the show has a lot of potential. I mean, I, I've not read the manga. I have to say, as far as like new shonen manga go, I'm the only one I haven't read is Fire Force. Weird. Yeah. So and yeah, I really liked it. It's, 
the the trailer had me hooked like oh, the the animation is like a so ago. beautiful yeah there's money in it's there. is it bones uh fuck, I don't oh remember. it's madhouse i think it's madhouse one of those uh it's either bones or madhouse it's one of the two let me look it up fire force oh I'm or looking. David, it's, it's David, David production. It's David. Yeah, production. it is. The last one. There we go. Well, there we go. And David production, of course, are the, the people JoJo. who do JoJo. So and boy, and, oh, and they do uh, Captain Subasa, which I really like as well. Uh, oh, true. Yeah, the soccer I'm like, series. I'm like so like not yeah. into manga and anime that I'm just kind of like thinking about like the American comics that I've been reading and stuff like that. Yeah, but I've been reading a lot of that shit too, and I have stuff of it like that to talk about. I but I and I know you do too. But um, yeah, Fire Force is is really excellent. Another another new shonen series that just started as an anime is um, Doctor Stone. Oh yeah, Did which is yeah really that good. That one didn't hook me as much. I like it. Is there a dub for it? Or just... There's no dub for it yet. Okay. Fire Force no. has a dub, gotcha. which is what I've been watching. Yeah. It's a good dub as well. Um, simul dubs are usually actually pretty good though. They they tend to they have to get really good actors for them. It's the only reason that people will see them as credible. But um, I really, really like Dr. Stone, the manga. I think the anime does a pretty good job of adapting it so far. It's only about three episodes in, mind you. So, yeah. mm-hmm. But um, Dr. Stone's kind of a little harder to get into because it's a slow start. But I want to say about like three chapters in and you'll be good. The, manga, the anime has like adapted so far like the first two chapters. So there's still a little ways to go. But yeah. the show is. But it's better they take it slow than. Yeah, it's just it's a surpass the. Manga. It's a show <laughs> that actually is going to live and die by its pacing, and I think it's a yeah. it's a really it's doing a good job so far. But the premise is that the Earth, like everybody on the planet Earth, is encased in stone for like ten thousand years because of a fucking light. Yeah, because of a light that nobody knows the origin of, and finally, after all this time passes, some people start two best buds. Yeah, two best buds in particular. Uh, are able to escape their stone encasement. Fun. And they're like, holy shit, the world has been totally retaken by nature. It's completely different. Civilization as we know it is done. So th- it's their job now to restart civilization. And Senku, who's the... the I guess he's, he's not really the main character of the show because he's not the POV character, but he's kind of the yeah. protagonist. Uh, mm-hmm. He's a super science-savvy dude. He's like a genius scientist for his age so much so that he literally has e equals mc squared stitched onto his clothing like he's yeah. that big of like an anime ass science nerd big old nerd and i i like this show too because the science in is it real isn't... it's real science all yeah of it. it's not it's not it's not that pseudoscience no it's it's absolutely real science which is like i think is the the big nerdy draw to the show for people who are mm-hmm. who are maybe not terribly interested in anime but love science it's seeing these anime ass applications of real scientific fact yeah. But, um, yeah, so they have to restart civilization. So Senku generates a formula that can only be used on, on a, for a limited amount of time on certain people to bring them back from the stone. And so now that they're planning on, on restarting civilization, they have to carefully choose who they want in their new civilization yeah. of people. But they make a fucking mistake early on because the first guy they reawaken... <coughs> Uh, is a fucking he's dick. a psychopath he's a might makes right thinker and he's really phys- hitler 2.0 yeah he's really some might say. he's really physically strong and in like in their like ridiculously yeah strong. and in their defense if you're going to restart civilization you need somebody who could keep the rest of you safe so in that mind yeah. it was a good decision what they didn't count yeah, how on how are you to know that he was a, a psycho a a a purist of the age. Exactly. He's he's a crazy person who is the sort of person that would have never thrived in the time that they're from, contemporary times, because he would have been, mm-hmm. you know, considered a fucking loser with no aspirations. But yeah. as a super physically powerful dude with like a one track mind, in a world without technology, he knows that he can be fucking king. And like I said, he believes in might making right. So only the strong deserve to live. Only the strong deserve to survive. Me too. So now these fucks have an antagonist to compete against as they use science versus force of will uh, yeah. in like a battle of the a little, literally a battle of physical strength and uh, you know mental fortitude. 
to see Mm -hmm. who is going to be able to restart civilization and one up the other in like an arms race it's so fucking cool and that's the thrill of this book later on is seeing these two sides compete seeing them scrape together from basic scientific knowledge new ways of competing against the dude who's like an unstoppable fucking machine it's really cool evil goku he is evil goku essentially actually that's a really good way of putting it so yeah it's fucking cool it's a really really good show i watched the first two episodes of the anime and i thought you guys have done a good job hopefully it continues to be good and that is madhouse doing that yeah and they're doing a good job with that um uh i have a one more that i watched sure um it's a little bit of a mouthful as a title do you love your mom and her to hit multi-target attacks Excuse me? <laughs> Do you love your mom and her two-hit multi-target attacks? What is this about? Now, this is, <laughs> it's not It's not as creepy as it sounds. It's actually kind of... So far, uh, I mean, there's only one episode, and I did some research to make sure that it doesn't turn into the thing. Uh, okay. Uh, and so far, it doesn't seem to turn into the thing. So what is it? But it's, it's about a loving mother and her teenage boy, and they get uh, selected by a government program to beta test a online video game mm-hmm. in which you are sucked into the computer. Okay, so um, uh, I love, I love, <laughs> I love every fucking isekai <laughs> that's yeah. ever come out. So essentially, you'll probably really like this. I watched it, and uh, it's. It made me laugh, like, what, out loud. What, what's kind of the, the thing that you think sets it apart from the rest of, like, every isekai that's like this? Uh, so far, the fact that it's the only one that I could watch a full episode of and not go, uh... That's fair. I, the only one that I've liked <laughs> is Log Horizon, and, uh, I liked, um, uh, Konosuba. Yeah, Konosuba's Konosuba's right. funny, though. Like, that, the thing that sets yeah. Konosuba apart from the rest of those shows is that it's, like, abjectly straight up a comedy about terrible people. So it's, yeah. it's funny. Well, this one, this one ends kind of on a, it starts leaning towards the, like, I'm your mother and I love you. And then she's like, haha, just kidding. <laughs> it, it, like, leans into the creepiness and then is like, it's a joke. We're not going to do that. Okay, thank God. So, so, like, it seems to be fine and, like, uh, if the OP is to be uh, trusted, he's going to meet a bunch of, like, I think four other waifus, and I can only imagine that it's going to be, like, him trying to be like, hello, ladies, and then his mom just embarrassing him with her overbearing love. You know what? That's dope. It's it's actually really I, cool. I, that it's, sounds really funny. I, I really enjoyed the first episode I like so I like far. the idea of something playing on the conventions of a harem anime, but then inserting an overbearing parent into the mix yeah and that's essentially what i can so far tell is happening again i did a bit of research to make sure it doesn't uh do the thing yeah and it doesn't uh, so far and it doesn't seem to so far that's very um, good the premise is like like i said like government's like hey come test this video game and, and he's like okay i'm finally free from the shackles of my overbearing mom and i'll be able to live you know yeah. whatever honey i'm coming uh, with and you. then uh, yeah and she's like hi i'm here and she's like, why the fuck are you here? And they're like, they told me not to tell you about it. And he's like, what do you mean? And he's like, if you don't tell me, I'll disown you. And she starts crying. He feels bad. And he's like, okay, whatever. Um, they get weapons. He gets, uh, I don't remember what it's called, but he gets one sword and it's okay. Uh, his mom pulls two swords from the stone at the same time. And they're both like... Uh, to, to hit multi-target attacks. Okay, okay, right? okay. So, like, she just kills everything in one swing. Perfect. And he's like, why do you have the cool swords? And I have this baby sword. I like this. And she's like, oh, but the manual says that if 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 you have the, the two-hit multi-target attacks, your son will give you a big hug and want to go on adventures with you. Why don't you want to? That's It's, that's, it's, it's really cute. It actually sounds quite like funny. Yeah. Uh, okay, well, I guess I'm going to uh, have to watch that. There's another one I wanted to check out too, sure. but decided not to because I did research again and it did do the thing. Oh, okay. And just from the title, you'll know the thing. And it's like, if it's for my daughter, I'll even slay the dragon, uh, a demon lord or okay, whatever. Okay, yikes, fuck it. Yeah, no. And like, it, it comes off as really cute and fun and stuff at first and innocent, and then it does the thing. All, all uh, I have to per- say is... Like, later in the manga, and I was like, fuck that. I'm there done. is I'm literally own, only one fucking uh like dotaru ass anime that i liked and that was um uh amamoto inazuma sweetness and lightning 
Yeah. And that one's mostly just because it's it's actually earnestly cute, as opposed to mm-hmm. being kind of creepy and having like a weird dynamic between a parent and a child. Yeah. yeah, which we know is definitely there for fucking perverted otaku and not for people with yeah. brains. I like and like I just wanted to enjoy a story of a uh, fucking fantasy land man finding a small demon girl adopting her as his daughter and like enjoying a a, a wholesome adventure. In- but instead, no. it is instead they fucking... get married. Nope. <laughs> Fuck that. Yeah. That's terrible. Get out of here. I hate uh, it. Uh but she's a demon. Just, she's no, old. No, she. But nope. no, but <laughs> no. Nope. Like no, get out it's of here. A, it's, it's a sucks. child. It's the worst. Put it away. I, I, uh, I'm fucking horrible. done. <laughs> Why would? Yeah, no. I was so disappointed. Um, in terms of like other stuff that I was watching, Dex got me in, in the in the few months that we've been away. Dex finally got me into RuPaul's Drag Race. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, <laughs> season ten was whack and sucked. Uh, no season one eleven have won. is whack and awesome. So I so I started by watching all of season eleven as it aired. Season eleven yeah. is really good television, and not to say I'm biased, but I definitely am to a certain extent because in the end, the queen that I was gunning for since day one ended up being the winner, mm-hmm. and. Uh, that particular queen, whose name I will not say just in case nobody knows yet and doesn't want it spoiled, because it is a really, really, like, mm, like, delicious victory after, like, episode upon episode of this person being, like, treated like shit and laughed at. Um, like, it it was, it was great television, and it was very, very satisfying to see somebody who I, I deeply respect as an artist be recognized for their talent. I mean, any, anyone could have won that season that wasn't silky, and you would have been like, this is a deserved victory. The one person about the, the one thing I will talk about in, about the season is, there is a queen on the season named Silky Nutmeg Ganache, and by this point, the Drag Race fandom in its entirety is fucking done with her and hates her really, really, really deeply hates her. But the thing is, she's kind of easy to like at first because she's charming and loud and funny. And Mm -hmm. then the charm dies after like the first episode and you realize, Oh, she's actually a super stuck up really like mean bitchy person who does nothing but shit talk other people and blame them for her shortcomings uh, as both a drag performer and a human being. And she's kind of just an awful person, like really awful. And I'm, I'm not saying that to make a moral judgment call about a stranger, but if this is the sort of, this is like somebody who clearly knows they're on a TV show and this is the way they choose to present themselves. Like, they didn't, she didn't even get a villain edit in the show. Like, they didn't even make her into the season's... They didn't have to. They didn't have to make her into the season's antagonist for her to seem like the season's antagonist. Okay, is that feeling? Get used to that. Oh, yeah. So, I... (laughs) It happens in, like, all seasons. So, I I, we started then by watching season five. Uh, six. Oh, yeah. No, season six. It was six. No, season five, because it was after Sharon Needles. Yeah. So I watched Sarah Needles' season four, right? Yeah. So we watched, started on season five. Um, season five of RuPaul's Drag Race is some of the most engaging television I've ever watched from like a narrative standpoint because of a particular drag queen's arc throughout the whole season. Um, mm-hmm. It's another case of the person that I really like that season being the one that wins. So... Uh, this I will spoil because it's season five. It was aired years ago. And I want to talk about it. Um, so season five, a lot of the drag performers on that season are not that great. They're kind of bog standard, boring performers in terms of both their aesthetics and their, like, you know, creative choices. But Jinx Monsoon is kind of the underdog. She's the one performer on the whole season who seems to have some level of artistic integrity. And she really puts herself out there when she's performing and does these kooky, crazy characters and these really innovative and cool looks. But every time she's up there, you see all of her competitors treating her like shit, both in the workroom, where when they're preparing their stuff, and on the runway people just kind of treating her disrespectfully 
uh, ganging up on her, generally just being mean, ugly, bitchy people to her, despite her being, by at least everything evidenced in the show, a totally nice, like, genuine person. And this is how they treat her. It pissed me off, to say the least. Mm -hmm. So I found that really, really, really upsetting. But what's great about it at the same time is that because the rest of these queens are so, so detestable, uh, particularly a group of three queens that they call themselves Relaska Talks because it's the combination of their names, but it's Detox, Alaska, and Roxy Andrews. Es- Roxy Andrews and es- especially Roxy Andrews are super nasty to Jinx. They say and do terrible things to her throughout the whole season uh, and make fun of her, make fun of her narcolepsy, which she, she has narcolepsy and they show multiple times throughout the season her kind of falling asleep by accident yeah. in the workroom or like having trouble struggling with it. And the rest of the Queens laugh at her for it and they make fun of her and they, they, they act so, so awful. And back when they get to like the top four, Relaska talks this whole group of people they're clearly gunning to be the top three and they're saying all season we're going to be the top three we're going to be the top three queens we're going to compete against each other in the finale we're going to be the top three uh the whole fucking season it's like this and then pretty much out of nowhere jinx being the only one of the three of them that is there uh to compete beats uh was it alaska uh, detox. It's, yeah, sorry, beats Detox in a lip sync and gets to move into the top three. So this whole notion of Relaska Talks, top three goals, is shattered. And you see yeah. how much it destroys the morale of the other queens. To have this person who they've treated like shit repeatedly over and over and over again throughout the season inch out their chances of being the top three together like they've been saying since the beginning of the show. And not only is that... Oh, if if this season had just ended like that and one of those two had won, I would have been like, you know what? At least Jinx made it to the top three. She proved to them that she was worthy of being at the top with all th- with the other two, that she was g- good, you know? That would have been fine. But they go the extra mile. She fucking wins. She beats these bitchy, awful queens that have been treating her like shit throughout the whole season. Like absolute dog shit. And she s- fucking smashes them. She destroys them. It's fucking incredible. It's like one of the most fucking satisfying pieces of television I've ever watched. Simply because it proves in like real time storytelling with real people that being a dick to other people and underestimating them doesn't pay. That being a fucking bullying asshole doesn't pay off. You end up looking like a fucking fool in the end. And Roxy and Alaska and Detox look like the biggest fucking clowns by the end of that season. Because the whole season they've been saying, oh, Jinx isn't a fucking good drag queen. She's broke. Her style sucks. She's too blah. She's this. She's that. And she fucking smokes all three of them so fucking hard. So hard. The, um, in terms of, like, the only one to... It's interesting because in All-Stars 2... They brought back Alaska Talks, and Alaska is the one that smokes the two of them because she wants nothing to do with like that alliance again, and she's the one who wins at the end of All Stars too. And That's I'm satisfying. Like, I'm like dead. The, the, that trio is just really together are a toxic bunch. They they really you toxic yeah you toxic you bad and their drag honestly. <laughs> was nothing, especially compared to Jinx, was nothing to write home about because they kept they kept acting like shit and saying, oh, Jinx is a comedy queen, she's a comedy queen, but we're pageant queens, we're glamour queens. We like to do yeah. glamorous outfits. And there's, I get that in the drag community, there is kind of this divide between the culture of drag as comedy and, and as performance art and drag as like, you know, beauty pageant type shit. But... Maybe as somebody who is particularly inclined to being interested in the arts, you know, and the artistic aspects of different things, I find the whole beauty pageant thing, while, you know, understandably interesting to some people, completely and utterly boring and, like, creatively bankrupt. And Mm -hmm. the fact that you see all these these three queens who are 
are so thoroughly uncreative and interesting in with their looks and the execution of their their drag style uh constantly shitting on somebody who is always subversive always interesting always doing some cool shit uh it it's you know it's it's nice to see them get proven wrong that there is value to what the kind of you know drag that jinx performs that she not only is she a talented uh like drag performer but she's a talented musician a talented singer she's a talented comedian she's all of this and more and these three really don't have chops in anywhere other than the looks department you know being pretty isn't the only thing that matters when it comes to drag you have to be entertaining Mm -hmm. you have to make people laugh especially because so you know what snatch game is it's like they're big it's like the big thing that everybody waits for every season where they play match yeah. match game is celebrity impersonations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All three of them of Alaska talks literally couldn't be arsed to do anything beyond their comfort zone with the um, with their performances in Snatch Game. I didn't find any of them funny or entertaining. But Jinx is out there pulling fucking little Edie from Grey Gardens yeah, out yeah. of her ass for her performance in Snatch Game and she fucking kills it. She's so funny. She is so, so fucking funny. And the rest of them don't even hold a candle in terms of not only how interesting and unique the comedy is that she's pulling off, but how nobody else uh in probably the entirety of Drag Race would have been able to pull it off either. You mm-hmm. know, it was totally a her thing to do and it worked. None of these other bitches bothered to be themselves, and if they were being themselves, themselves sucked. You know, so anyway, Drag Race is... Hot take. Dra- Drag Race is an interesting show. It's got a lot of problematic aspects to it. Oh. So, oh, so many. I mean, pardon pardon the language here, uh, but one of the major things that they just kept for like a whole whole bunch of time was just this whole, you've got she joke. Yeah. Yeah. And there is and I'm I'm about to use a I'm about I'm about to no. say an incredibly transphobic slur. Ryan, Ryan, it's okay. Oh he's gonna say it. Ryan, you can say it. You I, can say it once. Okay, my trans boyfriend is telling me I can say this word. But there is literally a challenge, a mini challenge at the beginning of one episode where they have to perform one of RuPaul's songs. And there's like three songs playing. They have to lip sync it just with like their lips so that they can give a cool performance just with their mouths only. And mm-hmm. the three song choices were, um, uh, the, f- it was, okay. How about I wait, say it? No, what's, what's the one that isn't transphobic? Peanut butter. So there's one called peanut butter and then a succession of two incredibly transphobic words. <laughs> one of the songs is called tranny chaser. And the other one is called, Lady boy. Yeah. So that's, Fine. I mean, that's just a microcosm for how problematic Holy RuPaul shit. can be as a whole. Remember, remember just like, the worst thing RuPaul has ever said was the word peanut butter. <laughs> yeah, I can't believe it. Peanut butter. Truly one of the most horrific slurs of all time. I'm so offended. Do you know how much peanut butter, peanuts kill people? Yeah, I know. Especially me. <laughs> oh. uh, this can fit a lot horrible. of this. But yeah, no, it's I, I, find, <laughs> I find it absolutely mind You can fit so much transphobia in this yeah. Actually, it slaps Hood of Car. <laughs> slaps RuPaul. Slaps RuPaul. RuPaul, sachet <laughs> well, away. Well, Ryan and I were joking once one time. I was just like, what, did, what would you do if you like met RuPaul? And you were like, wow, you're such, you're such a great je- guest judge on Michelle, Michelle Visage's Drag Race. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, I don't know. The show is extremely problematic and RuPaul himself is just extremely problematic but there is some entertainment value to be had in in consuming this television show and seeing a season of tv that good from something that i expected to be total garbage was really really uh like a cool experience and i that's why i'm going to continue watching the show from now on it's also like one of the few shows that have like queer people of color yeah i mean once again Mm -hmm. the the winner of the latest season, uh, I will not say their name just in case nobody's aware, is African American and Native American. And so it's no longer just Trixie Mattel. No, lo- no longer is it just Trixie Mattel, the sole, uh, this the sole Native winner of a RuPaul season. Uh, but it's uh, a really, really interesting show. It's fun to watch. It's kind of like pro wrestling, but instead of 
uh, beating the shit out of each other. They dress up in cool outfits. They talk and, this shit. Yeah, and Vogue like, at each other and snap at each other. It's like... It's, it's like suplexes, but with words. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's like if you mix wrestling and, like, Project Runway. Yeah, it is. That's exactly what it is. And it's, um... It's entertaining television. So yeah, RuPaul is something that I never thought I'd be able to get into. Yet somehow it's something that has totally become a part of like my my TV schedule. It's really funny because probably about mm-hmm. a year ago I used to send Ryan like Trixie Mattel memes. And he's like, I don't like her. I don't like her makeup. She looks like a fucking clown. This and that. And then it was just sort of like I slowly like wore him down. I kept on sending those memes. And I'm like, look how valid Trixie Mattel is. And Ryan's like, fine. Only Trixie Mattel. That is the only drag queen that you, matters. And then... You let the drag queen damage yeah, stack. And it broke through the armor. Literally it did. And then season 11 came out. And it, the first episode aired a week before Ryan came to visit me in March. And then I was like, Ryan, can we just watch the first episode of Drag Race? Like, come on, it'll be fun. Just one episode. And then he was just like, oh, when's the next episode coming out? And I'm like, oh, like Thursday. And he's like, cool, we're going to watch it. <laughs> and then it just <laughs> kind of fell out from that because all of the seasons uh, are on Netflix except for season 11. So we've kind of been using my And Netflix. All Stars. And All Stars. Uh, uh, yeah. We've just kind of been using my Netflix password to uh, watch all the other seasons. But uh, yeah, it's... Uh... Much better television. It's good TV. Much better television than I expected it to be. Especially because yeah. I don't like reality TV is not a part of my, my T V diet at all. You don't watch you don't want to watch Flavor of Love? I forgot that but that that's existed. Art. That's not reality television. <laughs> yeah, no, that's Okay, just but art. what's better? Art. Flavor of Love or Rock of Love? Do you remember Rock of Love? Flavor Rock of, of Love with uh with Brett Michaels? Flavor of Love. That was more off the shit. Every time. I mean, Flavor Flavor of Love is... Boy! I'm Beyonce! Why why would anybody... (laughs) Why would anybody ever want to fuck Flavor Flav? I'm sorry. It's for the money. You get money. (laughs) You want to see this this formerly famous rapper fuck a bunch of sluts? Then watch this shit. Yes. Yeah. Do you want to talk... Sign me the fuck up. Yeah, okay, so Toronto. We did a lot of cool stuff there. Um, amongst the nicest, most interesting things that we did, uh, we went to the art gallery of Ontario and just kind of explored. And this is something that we've done the last like two, three years that I've been popping yeah, by. Yeah, but now it's free for anyone. But it's free 25. for anybody under 25. And since I am under 25, <laughs> I, uh, was able to get in and we you should just go every day when you're there and be like, still 25. 25 bitch. Sorry. But bitch. the permanent the permanent bitch. collection there is really impressive. They've got a much better, I think, a much better selection of art overall than the Musée de Beaux Arts in Mar- Montreal, which is yeah. it's a good museum. Don't get me wrong, and it has a good permanent collection with some really interesting and historically important artwork, uh, contemporary and otherwise. But it just doesn't hold a candle to the AGO because the AGO is just so so much bigger. And also, the AGO is mm-hmm. really pushing for a lot of like new art and like indigenous art. And, yeah, like, and they're making an active Canadian effort. Identity they're making art. an they're making an active art to uh, an active art an active effort to kind of like decolonize the museum too. Like they're returning yeah. uh, artifacts that were stolen from other cultures, and they're kind of fixing the blurbs and stuff and making them in multiple languages, including uh, Abishinaabe, which is really cool. Yeah. Uh, so there's like, um, just a, there's there's an active effort being made to decolonize the museum space. And that's something that has been needing to happen in museums for ever, ever since museums as a Western concept were established. So it's nice to see somebody's kind of trying to make that happen. You know, I know that we shouldn't congratulate people for doing the bare minimum, but sometimes it's just nice to know that the bare minimum is something people are even willing to do. Yeah. So that's really, really cool. And also on their giving part. also because they give out they have a grant program mm-hmm. and they have it for like specifically like immigrants and indigenous and artists, indigenous artists, yeah. like artists with disabilities, like stuff like that. So like they're really trying to push for like people that have been excluded from art spaces to uh be put into art spaces Mm -hmm. and also just like they've always been good with like kids and like lower income neighborhoods having access to art and like doing all kinds of other stuff like it's not perfect but there's a lot of good work but there's but they could be doing a lot worse oh yeah no they're at they're not doing anything that i'd actively call harmful which is nice 
Yeah. They're, they're, they're trying to, de- they're art. trying to, yeah, exactly. There's only so much that you can do. Promote the arts to people who are, or, you know, maybe don't have access to it all the time or don't have access to spaces to put their art on display either. So they're doing a yeah. good job there. And so, yeah, we went to the AGO and we saw a bunch of interesting pieces, uh, including uh, uh, a painting that I really like called The Academy by Kent Monkman, which is uh, a painting that kind of turns the gaze of Western colonialism back on itself by portraying a bunch of kind of Western colonists in in yeah. a tent uh, being painted uh, by a group of Native people. Uh, and you know, it's, it's quite, it's quite funny to see that kind of exoticizing, dehumanizing f- gaze turned back around on Western culture. Uh, it's, mm-hmm. it's really, really funny. So that's a painting that I really enjoy. There's a bunch of really cool subversive artwork there though. So if you're ever in Toronto and you want to go somewhere interesting and you're under 25, you can get into the AGO for free Even and then, enjoy like, yourself. The, it's not that expensive. I know, I know, of course. Yeah. And that's. That's not to discount the fact that it's not even an expensive museum to begin with otherwise. Like, we, yeah. we were going prior to it being free anyway. So that was really cool. We also, uh, we poked around a lot of comic book stores and bought oh, a lot boy. of comics. Uh, Can I go through what I got? Uh, I don't know if we have time to go through everything uh, individually everything. that we got, but we can just, like... Uh, I, yeah, I got yeah. I We're gonna have to skedaddle soon. We also, uh, I ended up going to ANC Games like I always do. I picked up. Th- did you find any? Did you find any fucking gems? I found. Th- <laughs> I found three GameCube games that I I wanted. I found Battalion Wars, uh-huh. uh, B- Bionicle the game, and Bionicle oh, Heroes the second Bionicle game. <laughs> you fucking but- nerd. Podcast the cool, the, the cool thing about Bionicle channel. Heroes is Bionicle Heroes is a game that's kind of really near and dear to me because when that came out, I would rent it from my local Videotron almost every weekend for like a month and a half, and I'm fairly certain that my memory card still has all my save data from that old game on it. So mm. I can't wait to kind of dive back into that. And they're both, in, they're all three of them are in pristine condition, mint in the box, and mint condition with uh, the manuals still there. So nice. It was pretty cool. That's always really. Uh, cool. I'm really, really kind of satisfied with those purchases. Oh, we should have checked to see if those uh, those N64, uh, N64, those GameCube games that I dropped off were still there. Uh, I mean, there was only Smash. No, it was Smash and Wind Waker. No, Wind Waker, uh, uh, Twilight Princess. And Twilight Princess. That's true. Twilight Princess is probably there somewhere. Yeah. But uh, yeah, we had a we had a good time doing that. We uh, ate a lot of good food, as always. Philly cheesesteaks. We, we went to a place in the gay village that sells Philly cheesesteaks called the Steak and Cheese Factory. It's right near Ryerson University, uh, uh, near the church in Wellesley Village. But really, <laughs> really, really good food. They source their beef from a butcher shop in Philadelphia. So when they say Philly cheesesteaks, they're, they're not fucking around. The, even the beef is actually from Philadelphia. So that Sick. was really, really good. And um, I've been looking for some good Philly cheesesteaks, I think, since I... There are, there are none in Montreal. <laughs> They're all in Toronto. Yeah. But... Uh, I, have, I have a Philly cheesesteak story. I don't know if we have time once right. again. But, uh, but yeah, we did a lot of cool stuff. And, of course, like I said, we saw Spider-Man. And we had a fucking time with Spider-Man, let me tell you. Yeah, that that'll theater be, was that'll packed. Be it. it was a Tuesday at... Three o'clock in Scarborough. Yeah, and there was just like everybody was there. Yeah, was it a good it was audience? A, yeah, it was a great audience to see. Movie. Did everyone go? Oh, yeah, oh yeah, time. everybody yeah. was like having I a fucking it ball. Happens. It was so cool. So that That's was nice. it was a good theater experience. And uh, oh, I guess I I did play one video game, and I've been enjoying it so far. Yeah. I've been playing the uh, the Pokemon ROM hack Pokemon Prism, which is mm. kind of an infamous ROM hack because it's kind of known to be like. The ROM hack that got so much unwanted attention from Nintendo that, like, the ROM hacking community kind of took a big blow from it. Hit. But yeah. it's that's not to speak anything of the game's quality itself. It's uh, one of the best Pokemon ROM hacks I've ever played, as somebody who's played a staggering amount of them. Um, it's a ROM hack of Pokemon Crystal, so it has uh-huh. all the old kind of uh, assets from the original games. And looks beautiful, sounds beautiful, uh, plays really nicely, r- plays 
in the in a way reminiscent to Crystal, but with some quality of life improvements from like all the way up to Gen five, and like a bunch of new Pokemon that are all the way from from like the later gens as well, but redone in that old style. So it's kind of like a demake. Uh, but I really really like Pokemon Prism. It's it's fun, and uh, the, you have a totally customizable player character. So I made a a, a, a cute little Goral who's all in teal named opal and i like her she's my daughter and uh i have a bunch of great pokemon uh in the game that um i really like using and it was super easy and fun to build a team there are segments in the game where you play as the pokemon themselves going through dungeons That's to cool. kind of help other pokemon complete mini quests uh and it, Mystery dungeon yeah style? kind of Cool. Except you battle in the Pokemon battle style, which is cool. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the turn-based system. And there's also just like, I don't know, just a bunch of neat stuff you do in the game that's totally kind of weird and off-kilter and cool. I, I really yeah. enjoy it. It's a it's a fun one. So, uh, yeah. Uh, Pokemon Prism. If you can find it, uh, acquire it illegally, obviously, because it's an illegal game to begin with. Uh, and enjoy it to your heart's content. It's a beautiful love letter to Game Boy era Pokemon games, and I, I, I couldn't ask for like a better experience from a ROM hack. Uh, so yeah, I that's kind of everything that we did. <laughs> yeah. Nice. I think. Uh, I guess we can talk about the dumb. Thing. Yeah, the 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 thing that. Uh, the person. Mm. The big sad. All right, take it away, Johnny. <laughs> so uh, I want to say what time was it like 10.50 in Japan right? yeah uh, 10.50 a.m. so like basically just a couple of a couple of, a couple yeah, of hours uh, before I woke up yeah um, some fuck with asshole an shit, arsonist uh, thought that it would be a good idea to burn down Kyoto Animation Studio yeah, so he... and kill about half of the people that were in there at the time. Yeah, so there were um, there were away... 70 people in the studio and 33 have been confirmed dead so far. 33 are confirmed dead. Um, there's like 20... There's like another 20-something in critical condition in the mm. hospital and like another 13 injured or some shit so like it was not a small no it was it, it was fire. A dis- apparently he also doused a couple of people in, in gasoline. gasoline before starting the uh fire which is ridiculous um it's they there's i'm looking for updates there's nothing really yet they like no reason why he did this um, really horrible yeah um it- Really heartbreaking. Yeah, just to see so many uh, a lot young, of t- passion and talent. young talented people. Who, you know, some yeah. some who have had the chance already to show us just how talented they are, and some who will never have the yeah. chance now. Uh, have lost their lives in like a senseless, totally random act of violence, and it's it's, it's really upsetting because Kyoto Animation is one of my favorite studios, and in terms yeah. of the studio's internal politics they're one of the they're mm. considered one of the best most equitable animation studios to work for in Japan they've set up they're so wholesome. they've set up tons of programs that help support and bring about kind of you know uh marginalized voices in the animation community in Japan mm-hmm. they've they've made a like a terrific effort to to make animation a worthwhile thing to work in because god knows it's in most cases a thankless horrible job and crunch. yeah video game crunch holds no candle to anime oh crunch. really yeah like video game crunch like development cycles are years anime crunch sometimes you have a week to complete that shit to complete yeah. those frames you generally it's have a week horrible and it's it's it, it, the conditions like really like bad. you said a thankless utterly utterly thankless job and yeah it's just it's so upsetting and, uh, and most times taken for granted yeah like the amount of people complaining about certain mm-hmm. things like oh this animation was a smooth enough it's like they had a day give it like fuck man they got a and you know e- just 
just so, recently even... they've been getting a lot of recognition for some of the recent series like yeah. um well, I mean, they did Full Metal Panic and uh, fucking yeah, K- K- Kaon, which is one, one of my, my faves games. as well. And they in 2016, they released A Silent Voice, which is like their first proper kind yeah. of theatrical adaptation. Uh, and it's it's really like that was a really, really great movie. And Naoko Yamada, mm-hmm. who did that, um, she also did Liz and the Blue Bird early last year, which is a, a sequel to uh, Hibike Euphonium. Uh, and mm-hmm. that was like a really stellar, really stellar movie as well that continued kind of from a disappointing ending to that anime. They also, I mean, most recently they've done Violet Evergarden, which is an anime that was a Netflix uh, exclusive that I really liked. Yeah. Uh, Miss Kobayashi's Dragon Maid, another series I really, really like and that I, I I've like have extremely, extremely fond kind of experiences watching. And to see just these, you know, these wonderful people uh, lose so much in like the span of a couple of hours is hours. Not it's, even. it's unfathomable and horrible. It's ridiculous, and I hope that the arsonist fucking rots. Yeah, honestly. I know. Like, I uh, like. It's just there's the death sentence would be yeah, too. It's, kind. it's it's just an uh, a senselessly evil act of of totally unmitigated and un uninstigated violence and i i just i can't i mean i can't even imagine what would possess somebody to commit arson whether or mm-hmm. not it's because they're mentally ill or suffering in some way to to externalize and hurt others like that to yeah especially yeah, ex- like the only thing people. that i could like it wouldn't even justify it it would just be like oh it's like someone who lost their job yeah right like that's the only you know th- you know un- that's the only link that makes sense it doesn't it's not an excuse yeah. for it obviously and it doesn't justify it and it would it's still horrible even if it is that but like that's the only that's, one yeah that, that's the only thing that like is like that that, that seems as like be it. it not sensible but at the very least kind of like oh but there's yeah. not even that it's it's but even so then, like it's horrible like, and uh, like I said, senselessly evil, and mm-hmm. to I I can't even imagine how much this is going to affect the studio moving forward. And maybe that sounds maybe that it sounds inappropriate or selfish to say, but it's just something that you know it. One of the many thoughts passing through my mind is like, with all this loss of life, with all these animators possibly suffering from immense mental trauma. What it yeah, what is going to become cause... of Kyoani? Mm-hmm. And it's 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 really it's a sad and scary thing to. Th- it's really heartbreaking, uh, and it's did it didn't need. No, to it really just like, a senselessly violent act, and it, I mean it's <laughs> it's made international news. It's everybody is talking about it. It's 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 horrible, yeah. and I I cannot. You know, I, I can't even begin to think what those poor people must be feeling right now, the survivors and the families of the victims. Mm-hmm. <coughs> Pardon me. To have their lives snuffed out so so horribly, so senselessly. senselessly. and so, so Yeah, so quickly. suddenly. It's... Like... Bleh. Yeah, now I'm, I'm, I'm close to tears, Jesus Christ. This is really upsetting yeah. to talk about. You can't, you wake up in the morning and then, you know. Yeah. Like, they were. Go to work and then this fucking. It's, it's really, whack. it's. It it's, makes it, no sense. It's ridiculous. Yeah, it makes no sense. It's it, something that, maybe it's something we, something humanity always says, I guess, when it's like, you know, it didn't need to happen. It never needs to happen. But really, mm-hmm. shit like this, it doesn't need to happen. And yet it keeps happening. And it's, it's just so horrible. Mm-hmm. So I guess like, you know. I don't know how to express the sentiment of thoughts and prayers without sounding totally bullshitty, but yeah, well, that's the thing. Like, I don't want to be like thoughts, thoughts and prayers. prayers. Like, I mean, I, I'm not but gonna, I'm not gonna sympathy. F- yeah, I, it's just extreme condolences like, towards those who, who have lost people, and to the animation community as a whole, reeling from this attack yeah. against their own. I it can't, it can't even fathom. I, I what it must be like. I, I sincerely, sincerely hope that somehow, somehow, 
they will find the fortitude to to bounce back from this Mm -hmm. but you know take all the time you need please like don't i i gotta stress kyoani please don't restart production on shit yeah please take take a break break. this is this if anything the most crucial reason ever to take a break on anything so please take the time you need as a studio as you know as as a collective as like a family of artists to recover from this tragedy and uh you know my condolences to everybody who lost somebody or knew somebody or you know as i said to the animation community as a whole because this is you know this goes just be you know beyond kyo annie too this is something that the entire yeah, animation this, community is reeling from there is this is gonna be animation history but in the wrong if way. you want to help uh if you want to help kind of keep uh some of the victims going and financially support uh the effort uh to kind of rebuild and stuff sentai filmworks has set up a donation on uh i think on uh gofundme uh, uh but sure. if if you go on sentai filmworks's twitter there will be links to it uh to their fundraiser mm-hmm. so if you have any you know if you if you can afford to donate a little bit uh consider any uh, and just, change would probably yeah, help honestly please just uh this is a it's a horrible tragedy and these people could use some help uh so yeah there we go it's kind of a dismal and upsetting way to end the podcast but it, it's something that needed to be discussed it's gonna happen sometimes yeah. <laughs> you know, it's something that needed to be it, discussed. it's better to end it on this than to start it and have it rule yeah. i mean this is probably the first time in the show we've ever talked about a studio uh and it wasn't because the <laughs> studio was mistreating their employees or because yeah. the studio was um engaging in you know like uh really f- dubious business practices this is just a yeah a tragedy and uh you know we'd like to extend our condolence our condolences a big one yeah. at that oh yeah really so yeah uh sorry for the d- downer of an ending but it needed to be discussed uh but uh, this has been game punks uh uh hopefully the next episode will be a lot more cheery towards the end but enjoy Probably. our I can't see anything stacking up to this. Enjoy our Spider-Man memes uh, and our uh, our in-depth discussion of Drag Race. Yes. The analysis, if you will. The Drag Race race Deep Lore. Yeah, exactly. RuPaul's Drag Race Deep Lore. Perfect. But, uh, yeah, thank you, everybody, and thanks for listening. Have a good night. Thank you.